Hey, everybody. Only four minutes late, which I guess isn't all that bad on a hectic day. Um, it is Friday, though, so I guess we get a bit of leeway. Um, I'm Kevin Marco, CEO at Coin Metro. Joining me is David Capsule. So I learned how to pronounce his name. Um, he was gracious enough to, to, to tell me that I was doing it wrong. Uh, so, but everybody apparently does it wrong, so I guess that's fine. Um, but David Caps, CEO at Encryption. So today is his day. So uh, you're not going to hear hopefully much from me, except for maybe reading questions now and again. But um, I guess as we wait for people to come in, I'm just going to ask David to introduce himself, give a little bit of background about Encryption, and then we'll start answering some questions. Well, he'll start answering some questions. I'll be asking them, I guess. You bet. So David. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Uh, so yeah, it, it's David Kepsel. Uh, and uh, I am originally from Western New York State, uh, north of Buffalo. I grew up on a farm up there. Um, and um, I have had a varied and modeled career, including uh, um, as a lawyer uh, for uh, a, a while. I graduated from law school in 1995, practiced law for, well, I'm still a lawyer, but um, I practiced law for about um, 15 years after that. Uh, I was also a, a professor of philosophy uh, for quite some time. I have a PhD um, in philosophy. Um, and um, my interests somehow converged on genetics uh, when I met the, the woman I love, the woman I'm married to, uh, Dr. Uh, Vanessa Gonzalez, who is uh, my partner, co-founder of Encryption. Um, and we met back in 2005, which now seems like a long time ago. Um, but uh, uh, she is a pharmacogenomics scientist, and that means that she studies how our, our, our genes interact with pharmaceuticals. And it's a really important science because um, you, know, you can target uh, therapies better, et cetera. So, I became interested in genetics and genomics at the time and realized there was actually some interesting things relating to work I did in philosophy and law. Um, and we'd been collaborating on papers and such. And, um, but anyway, I, I ended up um, writing a book. Uh, I got a post postdoctoral position at Yale in 2006. And what came out of that was this book. I don't know if you can, yeah, who owns you? Corporate yeah. goal to patent your genes. So one of the things I, I learned when uh, I, you know, I met Dr. Gonzalez and I started trying to figure out what she does uh, was that um, you know, the human genome was, the human genome project had only recently been completed back in uh, uh, about 2001 or 2000. And um, along the way, some interesting things happened that led to genes getting patented. So that became a focus of my research. Uh, and I, I was concerned about this. I thought this was strange, uh, to say the least. I thought it was possibly unjust. Um, and so at Yale, I, I did some lectures, and I, and I wrote the book that uh, came out in 2009, Who Owns You? Um, and my conclusion there was that you know, it was probably, <laughs> it was uh, both ethically and legally uh, wrong uh, to patent genes that were unmodified. Um, but that was exactly what had been going on for about 17 years at that time. Um, and that, that launched the next phase of my life, really, uh, uh, and somehow ended up getting us to encryption. Um, and I, I can tell you that story, too, if you, if you want to hear it. I'd be interested. I think that's a super interesting story, to be honest. I mean, the, the idea that somebody could patent an unmodified gene, meaning some, a, a gene that obviously someone carries that, that should be kind of their property yeah. um, seems crazy. Um, yeah, it, absolutely. It, it seemed crazy to me. And, and I, I mean, I, I didn't just write that. I could have been a very short book if I just said that. Um, but my, my conclusion was that, you know, there was a problem with the law, which was, you know, you don't ordinarily get patents on things that are unmodified. Um, no. But um, so it's, it, it, that was a legal issue. And there was also, I thought, an ethical issue. And I, my conclusion was that, so just to get a little in the weeds in the philosophy, I argued that there's something in, that we, we could call uh, um, uh, commons by material necessity. Uh, so there's, you know, there are things that just cannot be owned. Um, and the, the genome was one of them. Na nature itself is one of those. So the, the code that you know, has evolved 
uh, in you to make you who you are is is not ownable. And patents were an infringement upon um, that philosophical problem. So um, I, that was my argument. A weird thing happened uh, that got me kind of thrust into the debate in more than just an academic way. And that is that uh, three months after my book came out, uh, the ACLU sued uh, the company Myriad, um, which had a patent on the breast cancer genes. Um, so uh, then I suddenly found myself not just thinking philosophically about these things, but you know, I'm fighting um, alongside uh, these uh, lawyers who, who had brought the lawsuits uh, um, against uh, Myriad. And um, I did lectures. I, I wrote, uh, I co-wrote amicus briefs with other lawyers, um, and eventually went up to the Supreme Court. And then in, 20, in 2013, the law changed, and, and the Supreme Court unanimously held you can't patent genes, uh, unmodified genes. So that's awesome. where we were in 2013. It was a, you know, I felt good that you know I I was part of that effort, and you know science could then, you know, without uh, worry about, you know, the patents on, on these genes to do their work. And, and people who, who have rare genes uh, don't need to pay royalties to patent holders to get tests to find those genes, et cetera. So those, that was good. Um, but it left a, a big sort of gaping hole uh, in, in, the, in the, you know, our rights to our, our genetic material because now nobody could own, own genes uh, and you know, there's there's you know some in, there's obviously a great incentive to do the research, and we wanted to do, do something that encouraged people uh, to use their data for research. So that's that brings us up to 2017 um, when I had moved to Mexico. I was in Holland with uh, Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, she got a position with the National Institute of Genomics here in Mexico. And um, I left a tenured position in um, in Delft, uh, Holland. And one of the one of the things we wanted to do was figure out how to solve this issue of getting data, getting people paid for data, and 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 encouraging the science while you know encouraging also uh, paying people um, for their data. So that, in 2017, we we came up with the idea for EncryptGen, and one thing led to another. Yada yada yada. Here we are today. <laughs> it's so the yada 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 is also probably pretty pretty interesting, but I, I'm sure we'll get to some of that as we go yeah. through some of the. Um, so in, interesting, I think that the I don't I think it, when we originally spoke, and I was actually in Mexico the first time we spoke. I think I was in Chihuahua, if I recall correctly, when we had our first phone call. But I think you touched on some of this stuff, and it, it definitely I think the narrative itself is super interesting. Even even obviously not having a background um, in really any of this. Just from uh, just an intellectual standpoint, it's 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 a very it's very interesting to see how um, you know we I see in finance I've seen in finance over the years many times of how um, corp comp big companies big corporations whether those be banks whether those be uh, even central banks for that matter take advantage many times of loopholes and laws that generally don't do anything but enrich either that institution or, or remove rights from citizens when it comes to central banks. And I'm kind of used to seeing it in finance. And so, you know, the, the, obviously there's an assumption that this happens in other industries and obviously in, in, in industries like, uh, you know, medicine and uh, that, I mean, that industry is ripe. That, that's a very highly regulated industry, but at the same time, it's very ripe with, with similar issues. But to hear one kind of as abstract as owning of genes um, you know, it's something that that loophole probably would have never been closed if it wasn't for uh, kind of like minded individuals because like, like yourself, because obviously the, the nor normal layman is never really going to probably fall upon the fact that, you know, his gene might be on. I actually saw an HBO movie or a special about a, about a woman whose genes were used since like the 1960s, if I'm not mistaken, to create so, all kinds of different uh, medicines and et cetera, which yeah. was quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Hen Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks. I used to teach about her when I when I was teaching bioethics. So Henrietta okay. Lacks's tissues, actually, um, it's the, the the movie and the book are are both great. The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. She was a okay. poor Southern um, black woman who had a cancer. Uh, they took the cells out of uh, the cancer, 
Um, she died a couple of years later, but those cells became very useful and profitable for decades um, because they were immortal cancels, cancer cells. And people call them HeLa cells. And uh, in, in in many of the scientists who were writing about those cells and using them forgot about Henrietta Lacks and just called them the HeLa cells. We yeah. want, our, our goal, so when I was dreaming up encryption with Dr. Gonzalez, we, you know, we wanted to solve this Henrietta Lacks issue so that the next Henrietta Lacks, who, whose um, tissue or data helps to save lives and, and create medicines, um, is properly rewarded. And that, that's what we're trying to do. But yeah, so the, this gaping hole that I talked about was sort right. of crept into by the big genomic testing companies. Um, who are now, you know, uh, a lot has happened this past year. So 23andMe and Ancestry and, you know, those are the big ones. Um, there are 50 million people now who've been tested by those companies, um, you know, learning a little bit about their ancestry, um, finding out interesting things about themselves. The, the, the range of things they can learn is, is still, you know, growing. Um, but those 50 million people, 80% of them have also agreed, checked off the box when they do the tests um, to allow their data to be used by science. What they don't know is that that is the primary revenue uh, mechanism for the testing companies because used by science means sold um, yep. aggregated data sets for hundreds of millions of dollars so far to researchers from pharmaceutical companies and universities, et cetera. And most people, I've done those tests, I did 23andMe, um, we all did here. Um, you know, most people don't realize that, you know, if they choose to opt in to have their data used for science, they're, they're really enriching 23andMe and that's their whole uh, business plan. Um, yeah. And now this past year, it's been, uh, we've seen a, a real um, sort of land rush for those 50 million users with the purchase of Ancestry by, I think it's BlackRock, um, and for four billion. Um, mm -hmm. The SPAC that 23andMe is about to do, uh, because again, they're still not profitable and they need money. So they're, they're looking for capital by going, doing the SPAC route, which is a big deal, um, for again, four billion valuation. Uh, and uh, I just read that my heritage was um, purchased in an M&A um, by a private equity firm uh, for an undisclosed amount. So all of the big players, Wall Street is encroaching on this data and they're not going to have the goals that we have of you know, making sure you get paid exactly. for it. They, they don't have ethical goals. Well, their, their goals are to make money and that's, you know, that's the ethics of Wall Street. But we, we want to do that, but also help you make money um, in the spirit you know, of DeFi. We're trying to yeah. do DSI, what we call DSI. Uh, so we're going to bring individuals in, uh, who have their data into that marketplace directly. We're, we've created a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace for genomic data uh, where anybody can put their data on market, de-identified, uh, anonymously sell it. Any researcher can go and buy it. Um, and we're, you know, we're eliminating that middleman. We take a small commission. 10% commission on the, on the, on the um, exchange. Uh, and that's it. So. Anyway, great platform. I think I've said that already, but I, obviously, again, something that most people probably didn't know was happening, but I think most people, once they realize it's happening, uh, probably would opt for a better solution uh, rather than to continue to enrich, you know, enrich large corporations rather than, um, being paid for their own data, which makes a lot of sense. And that's not just about, that's not just on the genomics side. Obviously this whole, my data is worth something. I should be remunerated for my data started, you know, uh, a few years ago with, uh, with all the different, um, uh, well, data leaks and just, and at Facebook selling data and, and right. the big leak from Facebook with, with, uh, I can't remember the name of the, I, the, the name of the woman is. Cambridge Analytica. Sorry. The Cambridge Analytica. Um, Cambridge Analytica, yeah. yeah, there was, there was. I actually met someone from Cambridge Analytica in Switzerland right after that, and she was one of the main whistleblowers. So it was, that was an interesting conversation as well. But anyway, the, the world is the world is now, you know, focusing on uh, that. That is valuable. The, the next, the next revolution. We had the industrial revolution. We've had what I would call 
maybe the technology technology revolution or technological revolution that's still kind of ongoing but the next revolution is data absolutely mm -hmm. yeah. uh, lots of money in data so let's get started with some questions since we have a, a bunch rolling already so here's one from uh, th from youtube hey folks i want to get my question in early you were the first so uh that is by definition early what's the plan if the bond doesn't get filled say 50k 100k 500k targets thanks for your time Great. Okay. Thanks. So we haven't mentioned the STO, which um, so I'm very excited um, by the fact that we're um, using um, Coin Metro. You guys are hosting us for this um, STO. We're we're offering a bond um, because you know we built the platform. It's it's been out there since 2018, and now the challenge is to get users. And uh, so we've got about um, 1,500 uh, users who uploaded data and, and filled in their profiles. Um, but that's not enough to generate the kind of revenue that will make us profitable. Um, but based on that, we were able to calculate that if we get 50,000 users, uh, we'll start to turn a profit. Um, and that's not much considering 50 million people have been tested. Uh, so it's by what 0.1% of all of those uh, yeah. users. So the current capital raised through, through this bond offering um, is intended to gain users. And we, we know the cost of acquisition per customer so far based on our testing is about 20 bucks. Our calculated rate of return per user for us is about 10 bucks per year. So after two years, we've, we've made that back and everything after that is, is profit. Um, so the bond offering is um, based upon those figures to try to raise enough capital to get 50,000 users on and bring the cost of acquisition down. Um, anything we raise less than that still can be used to gain customers. So we'll start, you know, if it's 50,000, then you know, we're going to get, uh, you know, um, uh, maybe a couple thousand more users in. Um, if well, I mean, if we get 300,000, I can get 10,000 users on there. And that makes us a scientifically viable uh, database. And that's a really big step for us because right now when I try to convince scientists to use the database and I only have 1,500 users on there, it's not really a good uh, sample um, statistic. Yeah. But if I have 10,000 users on there, then they start to get interested. And people like my wife who do genomic research will use it um, and buy data uh, for their research. So yeah, at different levels, we, we can achieve different uh, goals. Uh, but we think we're going to make it, um, and any, you know, anything, anything we raise is going to be useful for getting more users. And, um, one, we'll use that. One interesting thing, I think, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I think the one interesting thing that I, that I would note was you mentioned that cost of user acquisition, so your LTV to CAC or your lifetime value versus customer acquisition cost. In, in businesses like, let's say, finance, lifetime value can only sometimes is only 90 days. Sometimes right. it's only 180 days where something like this, once you have the data, you have that data and it becomes part of a data set or a sample. And that sample doesn't just have a, 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 a lifespan of 90 days. It right. has a lifespan of years, uh, potentially even forever, uh, depending yeah. on how that. So, so that's actually a super important point because for us, if like for us, when we have to find that CAC to LTV ratio or LTV to CAC ratio, we have to be very aggressive. Right. Because it costs us 20 to acquire a client and we make, let's say, five a month, but our lifetime value is average 90 days, then we're losing money. Yeah. Whereas here, once you have that data, eventually you will make money on that, on, on that acquisition cost. Absolutely. So, you know, we have a very low barrier to entry for the individual user. Once, and we guide people through how to get their data on the chain. And any, you know, anybody can watch a YouTube video in three minutes, learn how to do it and set up an account. Um, but there's no cost to them. They just upload the data, fill in their profile. They sit, they get automatically a DNA wallet on our platform, um, which for many people is their only cryptocurrency wallet ever. It's their first time because you know there's so far there's not we don't see a lot of overlap between the crypto crowd and genetic people who've done genetic testing. Um, but they're getting cryptocurrency wallets, so we're also an entry entry into the new world of cryptocurrency. And it's really easy for them because they don't have to they don't have to learn anything. They can just sit back and wait for DNA to accumulate in their wallets as researchers start to buy data. Um, but anyway, so there's no cost to them. They can wait and 
check back in a year and see if they've ever sold data. Um, yeah. Also, also tokens that sit on our platform earn six percent a year um, for just sitting on the platform. Um, so there's also that if they just want to, if they make some DNA uh, selling data. So you can stake your data. DNA. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can stake your DNA. You stake basically. DNA. You know, I mean, the the DNA economy is going to be a thing. You know, yeah. your, your DNA has three billion base pairs, and that's it. And the stuff that makes it interesting is a very small section of that. It's like mm -hmm. one, it's like one percent of that is really interesting because it's different. You know, you and I are mostly the same genetically. So, you know, but that small part of your genome, we think, is a bank. You know, it's really. I mean, it's there's value there, and and we're going to all be uh, experiencing the growth of a genomic economy. Um, based on that value, and also based on the currency that we we created for it, um, which we handily called DNA. So I like the we made these little promo DNA tokens. Uh, we gave a lot gave away when we went to London uh, two years ago for the Festival of Genomics. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, it symbolizes really what we think is going to be a currency um, for the, all of the science of ge genomics and and also some of the consumer uh, activities as well. Well, I mean, if, if we talk about just the kind of coolness of tokenization, obviously everybody has DNA. Right. So something when you're tokenizing real estate or you're tokenizing, you know, antique cars or whatever other tokenization product projects that actually exist uh, out there in the world, but tokenizing DNA means everyone, everyone yeah. has DNA. So everyone can actually get a piece of that, that tokenized economy. That's, I think that's super cool. So let's see, we have uh, another question coming in from Uros. I, I think I pronounce, I've, I've been pronouncing this name now for three years. I'm pretty sure I pronounce it wrong, but there we go. Uh, so question for David, will you publish a roadmap for 2021? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, we'll update the, the roadmap. We're, we're going to be rolling out a new site um, in the next couple of weeks. I've, I'm just looking at a draft of it. It's looking nice and clean and modern, uh, updates our image quite a bit, um, but we'll include a, the roadmap for 2021. Um, I mean, in terms of development, there's there's not much more development we're going to be doing. We have a couple of Skunk Works projects uh, that we're working on, but um, there'll be some interesting consumer stuff too. Uh, so I'll, we'll put that in the in the new site when we roll it out. So mostly mostly 2021, I guess, is about growth. That's right. We we really need the customer base, and, and we think this is the time. You now we've got uh, a, a clear um, uh, public sentiment that is shifting in our direction. We have what's going on with the consolidation and monopolization in the genomics markets and you know the financialization of those markets. Um, and, and this is really a, a sort of um, a pivotal moment for us where we can use all that uh, uh, and, the, and the capital we raise um, to get you know, a critical mass of users. So that's, our, that's our primary goal. Um, but you know, we we actually just signed a, an interesting deal that helps bring us a a, a fair amount of the way on that. Um, so uh, people who are following us know we've just inked a deal with uh, Indigenous AI, which is a startup based in Kenya. It's a uh, it's created by uh, uh, the founder of True Genomics, which is a U.S. company. Um, and uh, Yusuf and I have been talking since he was at um, uh, True Genomics about how we can work together. He really agrees with our vision. Um, Drew Genomics had investors that didn't want to give up the, the, the um, control of the, the, the data. Uh, but when Yusuf started this new company in, in uh, Kenya, uh, Indigenous AI, uh, to start testing, uh, um, you know, doing genomic testing in, in Africa um, and helping clinical trials there uh, by getting data there. Um, he contacted us because he wanted to work with us. And, and we just uh, signed an uh, MOU with them. That'll get us um, their first 19,000. They, they, they have 19,000 subjects in their first um, um, sampling um, order. Uh, and, and those are going to become gene chain customers. So that's, that's a big deal. That's a pretty good number of people. Now they're still ramping up their sequencing um, capacity there. Uh, but uh, I know Yusuf is going to do it quickly, and 
and we're going to have that data in there um, hopefully very soon. Um, so that's that's and, and this gets back to what you said. You know, everybody has a unique genome. Now yeah. imagine being able to send payment directly to somebody's um, smartphone wallet, and and you know, many people uh, in Africa that's their primary tool is the smartphone. Um, they can use that to, to spend it to buy things they need, and and the you know maybe ten dollars a, a year isn't much to us, um, but it's a, it's it's a lot of money, and it's real it's it's real money uh, that can help people um, whose data is being used for science, also um, you know um, buy food and and you know, necessities. Also, with the with the rise of the data economy, you'd have to envision that not only are they making money potentially with their DNA data, but they're also able to make money with other forms of data, whether it be, you know, their web traffic, the, the, what they're visiting on websites, what they're all the, all that data at some point is start going is going to start to be, um, well, it's already at to some extent, but over over time, this data revolution is going to make sure that that also becomes you know some form of value or money. So potentially, especially in those third world countries, people will be able to live off their data. That's, but she, that's uh, the dream. Yeah, I mean, it, it really does democratize and and uh, um, you know make available all sorts of possible revenue streams, um, while also uh, contributing really important and valuable data uh, for science. I mean, this, if we look at this past year of pandemic, one of the one of the struggles has been getting enough data uh, to be mm -hmm. able to understand this disease and getting it rapidly enough. So there are, you know, um, you know, there, there are studies now into our individual genomes to understand why does some people never show any symptoms, for instance, uh, and some people die, and that yeah. there's got to be some genomic component, and, and having more data accessible from all over uh, is essential to solving these the next pandemic. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, okay. going on to the next question here. Uh, from Perica92, after two years, bond could be exchanged for growth token. To what valuation is the company pegged? Well, I mean, our valuation right now, so you now it's all, we're, we're doing a, a other, another capital raise in, in conjunction, and we're valuing ourselves at $15 million. Um, but in two years, you know, well, I mean, if we, if we achieve our goals, the valuation is going to be significantly higher. If you look at... Um, how important this data is and how valuable it is to the testing companies and how they rated $4 billion valuations based on their share of that market. Well, we can probably come up with a calculation based upon what our share of that marketplace would be um, for uh, a more accurate valuation. Absolutely. The sky's the limit, I think, in terms of I think we're we're at the very early days of of this data revolution, but even and those companies obviously have been in in the trenches for a while. Yeah. Uh, but considering with only fifty million users, which in in real terms is not that many people, you're not talking about a massive swath of the global population uh, of you know eight billion uh, well, is able to generate. Yeah. You know. And so that's four billion each, and they only have. I mean, they they share that marketplace, so it's about twenty five yeah. million for. 23 and me and 25 million for ancestry. Yeah, yeah. So eight billion valuation worth of what's that? Something like uh, one hundred and one one hundred and sixtieth of the world population. Right. So yeah, there's a there's a there's a long way to go. I think in terms of uh, value inside of those inside of uh, well for a cryptgen and all the other companies, but in cryptgen, thinking that they're sharing the sharing the wealth. I think there's a. Uh, there's not really a ceiling, to be fair. Right. After two years, can we get the principal back? If so, how will that? How will you fund that and yearly interest payments? Right. So, I mean, after, at the end of the two-year bond, you have the option to convert it into a growth token, which would be an equity instrument, uh, or you can get the principal and the interest back. Uh, so that's that's how a bond works. Um, and the way that we are are foreseeing funding that is by achieving our uh, user base. Um, and generating revenue. So at the user base we're targeting, um, we become profitable uh, to the tune of about 1.5 million within two years. Uh, so that, I mean, you know, that's that's not an issue. Um, you'll, you'll make your money uh, and we'll make ours. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think that I mean, obviously, just just from and again, we talked about this in the last AMA, actually, because somebody brought up we had our AMA about the token swap. I just uh, put out a caveat and I'll do it again in that I think a, some of the viewers here may have been involved in the Coin Metro bond um, and Coin Metro uh, ran what I would call a a, a um, let's say unique bond offering in that redemption was actually not to cash, but into our own XCM native utility token or conversion into an equity like instrument. So uh, in a normal bond, that's how bonds work bonds. But you know, if, if, if you get to the point and there is no option to redemption for whatever reason, bonds do default. The good thing here is that it's a convertible bond. So right. if you have a bond that doesn't have conversion capabilities, that means if the, if the bond issuer is unable to pay back principal, well, that's it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it ends here, though, if that were to be the case, you still have you still have that exit into convertibility into an equity option, which may take longer to see the return. But you still have a chance to see that return, which yeah, you're is now a, a part of the company if you choose that option. And, and, you know, we'll be, you know, using that money to make us even more profitable. Exactly. And, th and then that means you can you can continue to reinvest that money rather than having pay it back. Uh, and at the same time, if you think about a 15 million valuation versus a 4 billion valuation, um, even, even, and, and, and that's not the ceiling, but even just to reach that valuation, obviously the multiplier there is quite impressive. Right. Uh, so Chuck, Chuck Sneed, uh, so your numbers don't seem that impressive so far. Uh, how, uh, and your low rates are one, are one of your selling points. I guess he's talking about the rate of interest on the bond, I would imagine. I think and he's then, about, oh, okay. So, yeah, okay. May, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Maybe he's talking about something else. I guess we, we can't really ask him in real time. But, um, and then how do you sustain yourself? I guess we've already touched on the sustain aspect because obviously we're talking about growth here. Um, but if you'd like to touch on just this uh, numbers not being an impressive, I mean, you've spoken a bit about company launching in 2017, building of the actual ecosystem, which takes time. Um, I, I assume doing that almost on a bootstrap budget for the most part. So again, I've been there, takes time. And then now kind of now getting into that growth, that kind of uh, growth operations, which is why you're raising capital. But yeah. Um, yeah. So we raised about a million dollars in 2017 uh, through a limited token sale. Um, and that sustained us uh, through all of our development. Um, we've also been self-funding, so there's family money involved, um, and that's what's keeping the lights on now is the family money. Um, but um, you know, we put all our effort, all our money, uh, into making the product work as it's supposed to work, and building uh, relationships that would lead to partnerships that would lead to user acquisition at some point. So we have, as I said, 1,500 users who have uploaded data. Um, and that's been, you know, mostly through um, you know, our viral efforts, our community um, efforts, um, you know, not a real marketing campaign that could reach the 50 million users who are out there who could, you know, upload data. Um, so, you know, we didn't, for instance, try to list on every exchange the, the DNA token. We didn't want to pay the fees. Uh, and we got... You know, we, we got gun shy when uh, things like the Cryptopia hack happened and, um, you know, we had some bad experiences with other exchanges. Um, so we didn't promote the token. We worked on the, the, uh, the uh, product and, and, and making sure it does what it's supposed to do. Um, and, you know, I think we spent the money well to do that. Um, now we need uh, to raise capital to acquire users. So this is a growth phase. You know, uh, companies companies do that in order to jumpstart their uh, customer acquisition, um, and you know, going to the capital markets, however we can, um, is you know part of that. Um, you know, it's not just to sustain; it's to grow. So sustainability is not an issue because we can keep the lights on indefinitely uh, right now with our with our own money. Um, but growing the user base, so we become profitable. So everybody comes, everybody. Uh, who, who, who you know holds uh, their own geno genome uh, can come can participate and make money um, uh, is our goal. So that's yeah, the numbers haven't been great because we didn't really focus on user growth until now. And and development is I think a lot of people don't understand how expensive development is. 
I, I know I, when, yeah, you know, it's, when I when the first time I ever had a website made, um, I actually made a few myself. But the first time I paid someone to do it was I think two thousand five, and back then you could build a website with some form of automation, maybe like e commerce or you know build kind of a business for maybe ten to fifteen thousand dollars, roughly twenty thousand. Now we're talking about building very complex systems. Now eBay's website, for example, the first website probably cost remedial amounts of money, five to 10,000. eBay's website now, if you think about the amount of development money that went in, even though from the outside it looks quite simple, is hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, and if you look at something like Ignium, for example, Ignium, we've spent 1.5 to 2 million euros already on development, even though what you see on the outside might be four or five screens and a dashboard. Uh, but the and, and coin metro spent five six seven million euros at this point maybe more uh actually more for sure probably up to eight million now um on development on ongoing development development is expensive especially when you're the more complex the back the the the, the more the, if you have a complex front end you may spend less than when you have a simplistic front end and a very complex back end that takes a lot of time a lot of effort a lot of research a lot of development and, and it costs um, and for us, it, is, it, it also involves biology. So, I mean, we have a, a genomic data parser so that it's useful for researchers to be able to search this data. It's, it's not a simple engine, and there's several parts of it. Part of it is the genomics, and part of it is our bespoke um, multi-chain-based uh, marketplace in which we're able to adapt currencies um, as we want, and we can split commissions with um, partners if we want. So there's there's a lot of moving parts. Um, we spent you know a lot of money building it um, and put great care into it so it could be secure um, and create something uh, truly unique and useful. Um, so yeah, I mean, not bad for about 1.5 million worth of uh, uh, spending so far, but we need the 1.5 million now to get the users that make it profitable. And that's not too bad. I, I, I think I think you got I think that's a shoestring budget comparatively speaking to what could have been spent to get to the same the same level of of of, uh, of business that you're currently operating. So uh, sure. I'm interested in the team. Can David elaborate on the team behind this uh, this project? Who is doing what, et cetera? Sure. So um, as I mentioned, Dr. Gonzalez is my co-founder and our genomics advisor. She continues to be our our main test subject for using the platform, uh, and um, uh, she's been with us from the start. Um, Dr. Notis Gasparis, that is a simplification of his name um, because uh, it's a Greek name, and I have, I can't even pronounce it. Um, it's, Join the club, <laughs> the name pronunciation club. I'm not going to try because I, 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 it will just be insulting. But anyway, Dr. Gasparis, mm -hmm. our main, uh, has has served as our CTO and our our main uh, developer um, since uh, the end of 2017. Uh, so that's quite some time now. Um, he has built the the main engine, uh, the marketplace engine uh, of the product. Uh, several other contractors have worked with us and with him uh, to build the front end, uh, including a company called Blue Mage in UK um, and their team. Uh, and Notus also has uh, a fellow who's um, helped us with um, some of the front end for the, the site as well. Um, uh, his name is Paris, uh, Notus Paris. Um, <laughs> I, I like the alliteration there. <laughs> um, and um, so we've recently um, um, had a business partnership uh, we developed with BT Block, which is a um, blockchain-based and cybersecurity-based um, startup. Um, and uh, from them, we have Brian Gelazo, who has a distinguished career in finance, uh, who is now working as a chief operating officer and president and helping us with our our uh, approach to capital markets, some of the more traditional capital markets. Um, and uh, so also from BT Block, Brian Gale, uh, has, who uh, was with Stellar uh, and, um, and now does uh, marketing uh, work at BT Block and, and web page development, et cetera. He's um, uh, advising on, on our redesign. 
Um, we have a, a contractor who's been working with us also on the web page uh, redesign. His name is Stephen Dixon, also UK based. Um, uh, let's see, I have several advisors all over the world, many of whom have been with us since the token sale in 2017. Uh, I'm not sure if I should tell you who they are, but they you can check our LinkedIn and find uh, who's who's been advising us. Um, there's uh, you know about a dozen. Um, Monica Sandoval was our chief marketing officer um, for quite some time. Uh, she is uh, currently advising us, um, but if we raise enough capital, uh, we'll obviously bring her back to do uh, do the fine work she was doing uh, for us. Uh, when we could pay her what she's worth. Um, let me see if anybody else. Carolyn Seed was uh, um, uh, our, our COO uh, for some time. Uh, she is now an advisor and she still helps out with some of my day-to-day -day accounting issues. Um, and I have a lawyer and an accountant too. I pay monthly um, to, to do our um, books and, and keep us on the straight, straight and narrow. I hope I didn't leave anyone out. Um, I probably did. <laughs> well, it seems like a, it seems like a pretty high level team. So I, I, I think, uh, I think Encryptgem is going to do okay. Um, but obviously more money means, yeah, being able to expand teams and bring on people that, yeah, maybe you used to, used to actually employ. Um, yeah, it can be hard. It can be hard on a, on a, on a small budget to bring on, you know, stellar people though. But you can always find passionate people sometimes that are willing to jump in and do the heavy lifting without necessarily the heavy salary at first. But yeah, it, it can it can definitely be difficult at times. Um, but definitely, I, I, the, the core team has been with us for quite some time, and and I'm really just astounded by their dedication and commitment, and I'm grateful uh, for all they're doing. Absolutely, hats off to them. Hats off to them for sure. Is um, so uh, uh, Parika asking another question? Is interest is the interest amount accrued daily and paid yearly, or is seven percent paid to whoever is current owner? In other words, if you sell bond, do you get interest? Well, I mean, the, the igneum, you, there's going to be a token bond. Or, I mean, a bond token, right? Uh, which will there have, a, uh, there, there's a secondary market for that, so it's whatever the market bears at the moment, right? That's as yeah, I, I think. I, I think the question may be, oh, so that's, I actually just went all the way back up to an old question. Actually, I think the question is, so the interest is paid yearly. Yearly, right. Those, those payments come yearly, the 7%. Yeah, so it's not, a cure, it's not a cure daily, which means that if you were to sell the bond on day 364, the new owner of that bond would, 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 would be paid the 7% on the day that the interest was paid. But the so, bond can change hands at any time. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So yeah, it's not where we do have products on, on the marketplace that pay daily interest, meaning that if you're paid the interest, obviously you retain that interest. If you sell, you just don't get future interest here. This is a more traditional style bond where interest is paid either at maturity with the, with the redemption uh, as well with your principal, or if you convert with your convert with, with the convertible, or since this is a two-year bond and the maturity is in two years, after that, at the end of the year number one, day 365, you're paid the 7%. But if you don't own that bond anymore, someone else gets that 7%, yeah. essentially. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead with the next no, question. No, go ahead, David, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say, too, that we're, we have a couple of um, perks, if I could talk about them, uh, regarding the, the, the um, bond offering. So right now, people who buy 10 tokens or more get um, 500 DNA tokens with it, um, which isn't bad because you know that's it's like uh, you know that's a nice little rebate. I think it's about a 40% rebate. I don't know what the token price is right now, so um, it's it's not bad. But on March 1st, we're cutting that to 250 tokens for you know your your $100 investment. But um, there will be some um, things coming up that we will uh, give you notice of with very short notice. They're going to be flash sales. These are, it's, uh, I think you patented that term, Kevin. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Patent so, pending. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna replicate that and do um, announcements of these flash sales through our Twitter and Telegram channels. Um, you can find our official Telegram 
channel from our web page right now. Uh, it's on the bottom uh, for our socials. Uh, you can go to that and you um, wait there for word uh, of these flash sales, and they're going to be some some very nice perks that will well outstrip the current. Well, what's going to be the 250 tokens for the 10 token um, purchase? Um, awesome. There's also something else we're going to do as a promo. I want to share it with you because you know I, we have wonderful supporters, just people who really believe in us, who you know who've been um, very passionate about. Um, how they can help, what they can do. Um, so one of the things uh, we've come up with uh, is um, creating art out of your genomics. Uh, because, um, you know, one is it's one thing to get uh, knowledge about your ancestry from, from these tests, but can you create something really unique that you might want to hang on your wall? Uh, that was something I was interested in. And it's a data issue, right? So my genomic file is a text file um, of about 600,000 lines uh, with, you know, um, these um, SNPs, which is, you know, geno genotyping. So A, T, A, A, et cetera, all of these letters. And I approached an artist by the name of Michael Connolly, and I really like his work. He's a, you can find him on Instagram. And he does some interesting digital data um, work. Um, and I asked him, what can you do with my genomic data file that'll give me something unique, something I might want to hang on my wall? Um, so I'm going to show you a draft. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, it's a sort of a... Uh, there you go. That, that, we can see that one, I think, yeah. Okay. This is an abstract, um, um, but it's, it's my data turned into something that we think would be interesting. So he's come up with a couple of drafts. Um, this is another version, another version. Anyway, everybody's will be unique. Um, and we think this would be a neat product um, to offer people who use um, our services. Um, I want to buy one. Um, but actually, what we're going to do with uh, the first one, I'm, I'm going to, we're going to do, we're going to turn it into an uh, uh, NF NFT. Uh, so um, one of these three is going to be an NFT, and, and we're going to do a promo for the the company, uh, this product, and um, for the SDL um, by auctioning off Capsule's uh, genome as art, uh, and see who the lucky owner of my genome will be. Um, but th these are this, this is a idea that came up from the community, as you know, because you guys have a really vibrant, involved community. You know, a mm -hmm. lot of our best ideas come from people who are just passionate about what we do, why we do it, and who, you know, suggested wonderful new ideas that, that we're, you know, that we're now, you know, we're, we're moving on. Absolutely. That sounds, that sounds super interesting. So David mentioned, all in full disclosure, David mentioned this to me the other day, and um, I thought it was super cool. I think that, um, you know, NFTs are obviously taking off. I think NFTs... Right now, the main the main focus of NFTs is obviously art and, and and similar things. I think NFTs can do lots of different things outside of art, but right now that is a focus. And the, the I think the cool element of that is obviously you have your DNA, you have your 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 kind of account where you can get your DNA tokens. You could even use this kind of DNA art, this NFT D DNA art as your avatar. So it's kind of like the it's anonymized it's version. Oh my idea! I was going to do that. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's super cool. I mean, it's. It's it is it's just super cool. It's 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 a way to kind of self-identify with without giving away any real markers of who you are. So it's 100% anonymized self-identity. Um, that's that that could lead to even you know some form of of actual uh, the ability for to to pass identity between you know we're looking for sovereign ID kind of solutions all over the place where you can KYC yourself at one location and kind of automatically vet yourself at multiple others. Imagine if you can do that with your anonymized DNA in, in an art for in an art form. Yeah, so, you know, we can. Well, an and I'm yeah. sure that's going to be uh, another another part of uh, development for for our skunk work. Super cool. Super cool. I, I like it. So if if you guys just if you guys missed it, 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 yeah, flash sale coming up. Make sure you stay tuned to EncryptGen's Twitter account. You can get it right here on the banner that's going across the bottom of your screen. Add EncryptGen. Um, also, uh, there, I believe they have a unofficial Telegram group as well that you can find on Telegram. But make sure that you follow them on, on Twitter so that you'll know when what, what the details of that flash sale are going to be. David already said they're going to be 
Um, it's going to be a higher perk level than what's currently being offered uh, for for the token offering on uh, on the platform with Coin Metro. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, it sh you should get excited about that. I think we're becoming famous for these little flash sales. So I know Coin Metro's flash sale did extremely well because well we we were generous and I I, I think I have an idea that that this might be as or even more generous. So make sure you stay tuned so that you you know when the, the announcements made. Um, Jumping on to Link's lead uh, from YouTube. Question for David. I think with the right marketing, this could be absolutely massive. Agreed. However, a few of us doubt if you guys are going to actually be able to make it work. That's the only big problem. I don't see a question there, David, but uh, or Link, sorry. But, um, but I guess the, the question there could be, how are you guys going to make this work? I, I think you've touched on that already a bit. But if you want to summarize for Link's, uh, have at it. Yeah, I mean, I, so we know how to acquire customers. It's not a mystery anymore. I've done a lot of experimentation with direct marketing through Google AdSense, and I know I can get them if I have the, the dollars. So making it work really just requires the dollars at this point, and, and that's, the, that's the critical issue. So we can make it work if we achieve our fundraising goals and we uh, get the money we need to get the customers uh, that we know we need. So yeah. This is not anymore. There's not, there's not a lot of mystery about uh, about any of that. So once we get those users, for instance, if I get to the 10,000 user base, which I, I'll get to through the indigenous ag ag um, uh, agreement anyway, um, but I could get there faster if I have the money now. Um, so once we get to the 10,000 users, I can start to um, work with researchers who want to access data and say I have a you know viable uh, database for you and that's gonna we know that um, and once we get the 50,000 users and we're making a profit so I mean I think I'm doubt all the time links <laughs> this is yeah, a, yeah. a philosopher I live in doubt um, <laughs> that doesn't stop me from trying to do uh, amazing things and I think we've done some of that so far yeah, I, I think the again a lot of people. If you had never been through kind of this creation of a business, and then the hard, the heaviest and hardest lifting is getting to the point where you understand those LTV and CAC numbers, and understand your lifetime value versus your acquisition costs, and under and and have and actually have a platform or a business that you can and you bring those clients into, and you know proving that with fifteen hundred users, you've already kind of done I would say ninety five percent. Of the, of the most difficult aspect of launching a platform. Client acquisition is just, it, it's, 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 it's just understanding the numbers and spending the money to acquire the clients. I mean, that's, that's it. it it's it's yeah. relatively simplistic compared to everything else. We know the user base is out there, the 50 million people who've done the testing. They've got data at their fingertips. We just got to tell them, you got nothing to lose by uploading it and seeing what kind of you know gig money you can make off it. And and we know how to do that because I've done that. So we just need to increase the, you know, turn it, turn it up to 11. All right. So we have, we actually have a lot more questions. What we're going to try, let's try to do a speed round. I'm going to pick some short questions. Okay. Let's try to knock them out in 30 seconds so we can get through some of the backlog and hopefully answer everybody roughly around an hour in. So we're 53 minutes in now. So it's going to be like a game show. I'm going to try to rapid fire. Let's see how many we can get through. All righty. So uh, this one, Probably hard to get through in 30 seconds, but here we go. Uh, are you all at worried? Are you at all worried that DNA would be considered a security by the SEC? Well, when we launched the DNA token sale in 2017, it was before the Dow memo. Uh, and that sale closed before the Dow memo. And at the time, uh, we argued and we still believe that it was a software product uh, that we sold, a uh, currency. Um, and uh, we've been in discussions with them. I have lawyers who work with them, and uh, we're not worried that that's going to be the case. Uh, we never promote it as a pro as a uh, investment, um, and it's not an investment, um, and we don't encourage you to invest in it. Uh, we encourage uh, its use as a utility on our on our platform um, as the currency of exchange for the for genomic data. And if you want to provide it for that marketplace, that's up to you. Um, and we're I, we're, great, uh, we're grateful that it's available on Coin Metro's marketplace for researchers and, and data sellers to be able to convert to other um, currencies. Absolutely would say that that uh, most, I think that how we, you, the, the Howey test would be passed when it comes to the DNA. The, mo the biggest risk probably would have been 
um, having the token be in mass circulation before the platform was actually functional, uh, which is not the case. So um, I think I think they're they're also in clear waters. So quick one here: What's the current valuation of a crypto? I can answer this one because we already talked about it. It's fifteen million. Yeah. Uh, so we'll move on from that one. Um, we have a couple Coin Metro questions, and guys, if you have Coin Metro questions, what I'll do is is once we finish here with Encryption, if you'd like, I can take those questions. But I'm not going to bring them up on the floor right now. We're going to stick to Encryption. Another question from TH: How do you prevent the larger companies, 23andMe, Ancestry, etc., from taking your good idea, squeezing and squeezing you out of the market? Good question. Well, and I think their greed is doing that. So uh, you know, this Wall Street encroachment on on those businesses means they're definitely not going to share any of their revenue from the sale of data with you. That's that's their business plan is to keep every cent they get selling your data. Maybe someday they will decide that that they shouldn't do that, and they had, I think, opportunities to do it. Um, not Twenty Three and Me has never been, turned a profit. Um, so they can't afford to give up any of the, the money they get from selling data. So I don't think that's an issue yet. I hope eventually uh, we become uh, attractive to them as an alternative when they realize people are not going to buy into enriching Wall Street with their genomic data. If they, start, if they continue to experience what they're experiencing now, a plateauing of sales um, and you know, continued pressure now from big investors to turn revenues, uh, they may have to rethink their business plan. We've got I, think, I think we've got lots of time to create an alternative that can really um, prove a, a threat to that business model. I think if if they do see it as a threat, that's probably a good thing. Um, and then on top of that, you'd have to assume that companies that were taking money and enriching themselves based on your data that come out and then start to remunerate their clients for that same data will kind of be just removing the curtain yeah. so that people will realize what they were doing and it would probably push people to find alternatives. So that might not actually be the worst thing in the world for that to happen. Um, I would envision them probably making offer, putting offers on the table once encryption gets to a certain size, given the fact that um, why would you go and provide your data to one company uh, that's only going to enrich themselves with it for a very remedial perk. Um, and, and and I would almost envision comp that that in the future, maybe maybe David can comment on this, but Probably there will be, I mean, it, things like Ancestry, et cetera, they obviously, um, I don't know if they own those databases. I don't know. They probably pay for access to certain databases. Uh, potentially those suppliers of databases would eventually at some point want to partner with someone like EncryptGen when they have a user base that's large enough for them to compete with the big with the big sellers so that not only would you be remunerated for your data, but you would also be able to get the same services you get from these companies that are making money on the back of your data. Yeah, yeah I mean, I I think that at some point, where where if they continue to experience the this plateauing or start sloughing off of user base, um, they're gonna they're gonna view alternative marketplaces like ours as not just a threat but a potential partner or a potential yep. um, acquisition. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this I, this might be a coin metro question, but I'll answer it quickly. DNA have a market maker, so. Uh, right now, Market Maker isn't in place for DNA. Uh, this will be a discussion that I'll have with David actually probably over the next few months. At some point, it may make sense, given that given that the the main reason why DNA is listed at Coin Metro is so that people can come and exchange their DNA for whether it be cash or whether it be some other crypto to do something else outside of the DNA platform. Um, it makes sense that we have the most stable price we possibly can, the tightest spread we possibly can, and that there's always availability on both sides of the book. Those that want to buy DNA to participate in the marketplace, those that want to sell DNA uh, that they've earned on the marketplace. Um, so I do envision that we will be applying a market maker at some point in the future. We haven't done it yet, but it will be a discussion that David and I will have in the future because we will make sure that we have his consent before we go down that road for sure. Um, why do you have parentheses in your Twitter name? Um, uh, the triple parentheses uh, is a, is a uh, thing relating to um, you know, I, I'm Jewish, so uh, this was something adopted by a lot of us who uh -huh. uh, experienced anti-Semitic uh, uh, um, sentiments at some time. So it's a it's an embracing of of that. All right. Well, you got an answer. That was a rather weird question, but see, you got you got a good answer for it. So that's that's good. Um, so here's one. Here's a more business related question. What is the current company monthly burn rate, and what is the net income? 
Um, I think I know one of those because I was paying attention. I, I remember 1,500 users, an average of $10 per month. That's uh, or ten, sorry, ten dollars per year. That's fifteen thousand per year currently, right? In income, if I'm not, if I'm. Yeah, that's the projected income. So it's less than that right now because there's not enough buy pressure. That's a, that's a sample, yeah, exactly. So the income, the revenue from sales, um, is more like eight thousand. Um, the um, burn rate is five thousand a month right now. And, and that's mostly what in, in employee costs or or outside, not maybe maybe not employees, but people that are doing work for the company, whether that be, um, you know, um, and um, uh, cloud storage and, and compute and compute. Yeah. Okay. All right. So there you go. Um, so what are encryption sources of income, and how does it get, and how much does it get? I think that's been answered. But if you want to recap, since this is probably asked before we covered it anyway. Yeah, so so I, I just said we made you know we're making about on data sales. Um, I, I think that it comes to about eight thousand a year, um, but again, there's not much um, um, buy pressure uh, because there's not a significant amount of data. Um, so our sources of income, uh, I mean that's that's our revenue, um, but right now we've been operating on. Uh, loans to the company um, from friends and family uh, that, as I said, can go on ad infinitum um, because of our low burn rate. Very good. Um, will the bond funds be used for marketing in Africa, U.S. or only or only or Europe as well? U.S. is our biggest marketplace simply because most of the people who've done genetic testing are in the United States and we understand that marketplace better. Um, it gets a lot more complicated if you're trying to market to people who do genetic testing in Europe. There just aren't that many yet, um, and um, you know they they it differs very uh, greatly um, from uh, you know European state to European state. It's much easier for us to acquire um, U.S. customers. Africa, we don't need to market in because um, we're getting those customers through our partner there, Indigenous, and they're they're doing the the um, clinical research trials. Would you would you look for? I'm assuming you'd be looking for other similar kind of research trials anywhere else in the world as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and 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 we, I mean, there's going to be more that happens with indigenous because indigenous isn't just going to be in Kenya. Exactly. Okay. Um, our friend Chuck asking uh, why the 500 DNA bond rewards are getting slashed. Um, so yeah, I, I guess that's that's a business decision. But if David, if you want to comment on that one, go right ahead. Sure, uh, because we're going to institute um, new ways of rewarding uh, people who buy bonds um, starting in March, um, and uh, you know, uh, you have an opportunity now to get them for the 500 D uh, DNA. Um, we we think you know you can uh, you know it's probably a good idea to act on that while you can, um, or wait and see what the other. Uh, perks are going to be, uh, in any case, we're trying to create incentive. Yep. Yeah, Chuck, that's called FOMO. Uh, so make sure you get in, make sure you get in before the first so you can get those 500 tokens. But also keep 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 an eye on this uh, Twitter account below because uh, at some point they're going to announce that flat, those flash sale details, which, uh, you know, you might, I, you, you probably should split your investment into two pieces. Invest some before Monday so you get the 500 and then wait on that flash sale to invest the rest. That might be your best strategy. Um, but yeah, I guess that's, it's all part of marketing. Same reason we did a, same reason we do a flash sale, the same reason that, um, you know, companies, uh, raise prices, lower prices. I mean, business decisions, you can't give away 40% perks forever. Um, because well, at some point, you know, you actually need to make some money and retain some capital on the balance sheet. Right. So, uh, that's how things work. Ah, yes. Brittany Kaiser. That's that, that is right. Nice, nice AZ. Um, good, good catch. Um, Cambridge Analytica. Yeah, that's Cambridge Analytica. Yeah, Brittany Kaiser. Yeah, she's she's actually been on the circuit for quite some time. She's a lot of speaking in the crypto sphere. Yeah. yeah. Um, good old Chuck again. Here we go. Uh, did DNA perform as expected? I get. I I, I don't want to answer this for David, but I'm going to answer it for David because he already mentioned. And I think the, the token the token price is not necessary is not a as something that that encryption is focused on. Seeing as that the DNA token is part is a utility token used for the operation of the marketplace, and so I'm not sure that there was ever any expectation of performance. 
Um, thus, I don't think this question can really even be answered other than to say that it's not something that's being really tracked or something that's of major concern to the company. But I'll, I'll let David agree with me or, or, give, or give a contradictory answer. You're absolutely right. So, so the token price was was not the isn't the performance of it. The performance of it is as a currency on the platform, and the fact that it is functioning as a currency on our platform is expected and was exactly what we designed it for. Absolutely. So, I mean, it's worth noting that if you look on CoinGecko and you take a look at the token per performance uh, since its release, it's uh, it's actually not bad at all. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say that that it's not performing. But if you're looking at it from, I mean, obviously, while the company may not focus, obviously, if you're a speculator, you can buy anything and speculate. You could buy used socks and speculate on the price going up if mm -hmm. you'd like. To. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you probably would, you probably wouldn't fare too well with the used sock market. Um, but you know, maybe you'll find like a used Michael Jackson sock or something, be able to auction off on eBay. I don't know. Um, point is, is that, uh, yeah, I, I look at the chart, obviously I would say that, uh, if you bought DNA a few months ago, right now, you're probably pretty happy <laughs> from a speculative side as well. Um, all right, let's see what we have here. Still, uh, David, you still have a few minutes. We can try to get through a few more of these. You bet. Absolutely. Okay. So now I'm, I'm going to do a little more substantive search here and find things that I think other, well, this is actually, this was already mentioned, but I think it's a good thing to mention again. So photo dev asking how many samples expected from partnership in Africa. Right, that's 18,000 or 19,000 samples for their first study. Uh, that's just the first study, but um, they're, they're working with several other um, organizations there on numerous studies. So their goal is to get 100,000 uh, um, subjects um, and our agreement has them becoming uh, gene change clients as well. Um, here's a unique question. So Pedro asking if you can buy genomic data with Bitcoin or Ether already, what would attract someone to buy DNA? Well, you can't. So you have to use DNA now. Um, on our platform, you have to buy all your data with DNA. We had for a while the ability to do so with BTC and ETH um, because there were no secondary markets for DNA for people in the United States. Um, that was a big deal. So it's a big deal that we got Coin Metro uh, a partner with us and uh, allow people to access DNA uh, in the most important market for us. Uh, so now it's only going to be DNA. Um, and you can only buy uh, uh, data on our platform with it um, uh, from now on. Here's a semi-related question, but um, DNA is, ERC, is an ERC-20 token. If ETHs continue to grow, how will you fight the cost of transactions? Yeah, so the buying and selling of data on our platform doesn't cost anything uh, in gas. So our, our platform, when you do business on our platform, you're not going to get those fees. You, you're going to get those fees if you cash out uh, on some other secondary market, but it's not going to be an impediment for the functioning of our marketplace, and it won't affect prices of data on our marketplace. We built a, I mean, we built on multi-chain, as we've said, as our IDs notes too. Um, and, and our platform uses a native token that is not ERC. We, we created the ERC-20 token so people can cash out of it um, uh, when they need to or, you know, find it on a secondary market um, so they can buy it and, and, and get data with it. Very good. So, so yeah. So, so actually, yeah. The transaction fees only really come in anywhere into force when someone's moving around DNA outside of the platform to potentially cash out. Having said that, obviously, if you're going to cash out, I guess uh, you know. I, I would say that Ether. At some point, everybody who uses an Ether token, Coin Metro included, if Ether does, if Ether starts to lose market share and and lots of market share, and they haven't yet. Uh, per, uh, changed over to ETH 2.0, where they haven't scaled and they haven't been able to reduce those fees, Ether is just going to lose the business. Right. S simple as that. I mean, and I think they know that. So, um, you know, they're looking, they're looking to get those solutions out. Um, so this isn't necessarily a question, but I thought it made sense to post. So David always understates the accomplishments. Indigen USA will provide 18,000 DNA data sets, which is huge. So I would just like to say that um, just from listening to this without, obviously I, I have, I don't play any role in encryption, but having, having listened to, to David talk here for the last hour, the fact that at 10,000 data sets that now becomes an important or 10,000, let's say, te let's say, uh, 
uh, tests that exist within the, within the marketplace or, or, or genomes that exist within the marketplace that becomes an important data set for scientists, that's a major accomplishment because it means then that they're now, uh, scientists will actually be looking to actually purchase this data, which means that EncryptGen will start to be able to make more money off of uh, all those individual pieces of data, meaning that people that are using the system make more money off their data and also puts them on a pretty quick track to profitability as well, yeah. which is so I'm sorry if I understated that, but I am a, I'm quite chuffed, as they say. Uh, about <laughs> it. it's, a, it's a nice uh, it's a nice deal. It's really one of our better deals. A absolutely. So this one's kind of to me, but since it's re it's I'm I'm going to answer this one. So what made you pick the DNA to list on CoinMetro? So uh, mainly, oh no, Jesus, see I, I can't. How does it work? There we go. Mainly uh, David, actually. So I, I had a I had a call with uh, with David when I was in Mexico some time ago. Um, and I was introduced to him through 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 another person that I that 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 uh, that I work with, and yeah, after listening to David's kind of narrative, what he's what he's done, his background, you know, it's always important to me when we look at something that the founders aren't just founders, and that the advisors aren't there just in in name only or for show, and that the team collectively has experience in what they're doing, and not only that, but that they're passionate about what they're doing, and so David as wife and, and the entirety of their team kind of ticks that bo those ticks all those boxes. Not only that, but the idea is sound. From a business angle, it's a sound idea. Um, you know, this whole, the whole idea of data, the data economy, the fact that we're moving in a direction where people now understand that that has a value and that they should be remunerated for that, just like they're remunerated for other things. You know, if you go to work every day and you don't get a paycheck, you're gonna be upset because people inherently know that when they work, they should be paid. However, for some reason, it's taken so much time for people to understand that data that they generate from their daily activities or just from being human uh, actually holds a value and there are businesses making billions and billions and billions of dollars off of that data. So why shouldn't they be remunerated? So as people start to become to that realization, I think platforms like David are gonna be, are gonna be absolutely huge. So from a business angle, I, 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 don't see, I, see, I don't see any con, it's all pro to me from the business side and from just the side where, you know, from a, when you're a startup, when you're, you know, have a burn rate and you're trying to grow, passion is number one. If you don't have passion for what you're doing, you will give up at some point. And I think David and, and, and his team are, are full of passion. So, um, but all, all it took for me was one conversation. So I, everybody likes to think they're a good judge of character. And usually many times you can be wrong. Um, but over the years, I think you get better at it. So when you're in your 20s and you think you're a good judge of character, you're probably wrong. When you're in your 30s, you're probably you know, 30, 40% there. And by the time you hit your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, you get really good at it. And so I think now in my 40s, I'm a pretty good, especially when it comes from that kind of business side, just kind of get, taking an idea and thinking about it really quick and understanding if there's legs and if, if, if there's legs and they can move forward, I think I'm pretty good. And one conversation was enough for me. So that's why we listed. Thank you. Um, uh, so Chuck, Friend Chuck again. Chuck has been active today. Chuck, Chuck's coming through with the question. So, why should people trust you with their data? So, um, the data gets stripped immediately of any identifying char um, uh, characteristics. You can download the file and see that for yourself. Um, you can create an account with um, any email you choose. Uh, you don't have to fill in uh, your name. We don't ask your address. You don't have to do any of that. Uh, you never have to tell us who you are. Um, De-identified genomic data, um, untied to any identifying information, is useless. <laughs> Nobody's yeah. going to steal it, uh, uh, and nobody nobody cares about it. That's not the point of it. Um, mm -hmm. We use uh, HIPAA certified cloud storage for all of the all of the data you enter, all of the data you choose to enter, um, and you know we're using Google Cloud and we're using Azure. Um, and all of those are, you know, highly rated platforms for uh, safe storage of data. Um, but, you know, don't trust, um, verify, um, pro provide as little information as you want. Um, and, you know, the risks to you are almost nothing. If you've already done a genetic test, which you have, if you're creating an account with us, uh, you've revealed a lot more information to the companies that that um, you tested with because they know exactly where you live. <laughs> they know who you are, they know your name, et cetera. So, so if you've done that, you know, there's a lot of reason to go with us and then provide a lot less data um, that could be breached or, you know, 
um, in any way reveal anything about you. Absolutely, good, great answer. Plus, as 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 we've are, as David's already mentioned, and even because David, just to clarify, because David mentioned that the data on its own is kind of worthless, and obviously it is of value to scientists when it is in a large sampling. So it is it has value to the scientists, but not because of any specific singular data point. Singular data points are, are valueless. Um, so yeah. Yeah, the uh, aggregation of the data with metadata uh, yeah. into some significant sample based upon some query that the data yeah. becomes valuable. Yeah, exactly. So the, the construction of a data set on the data actually makes the data valuable. Um, uh, so this is a great question from Jack. So the, in the UK, police take DNA tests. Can you apply for this to work with governments to put it on chain? Actually, all police departments ser well, search for DNA traces uh, in, in investigations, I guess that's true. So yeah, that's an interesting question. I'm, I'm not sure um, it suits our philosophy uh, to be working with governments for the collection of large genomic databases. Um, our point is to create databases that are useful for science, to decentralize and, and democratize. Um, and, you know, I get nervous when governments accumulate uh, data um, because those databases could be put to other uses in the future. Good answer. Good question. Good answer. So very nice. This is not a question at all, but just I figured, why not? Uh, somebody just bought more bonds. So that's that's good. Thumbs up to them. Thank you, Grape Soda. Hopefully, Orange Soda and uh, and, and and Cherry Coke will come in and buy some bonds as well. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, Hard-hitting questions from Detective Sneed. Actually, you know, I, I, I play around with Chuck a lot because Chuck comes on our Telegram and, and, and on our Twitter as well, and I like to mess around with Chuck. But to be fair, uh, Chuck does ask some decent questions. So, so all good on Chuck. That last one was actually pretty good. Um, DNA is going to be huge in one year. Okay, a little bit of speculation chat. Okay, somebody's laughing out loud. Okay, well, I'm trying to get through these things. <laughs> um, another just statement, but good to see. Great to see some genuine passion behind a project. I agree with that. It's all. It's passion is a lot of it. You need a, you need passion to get through those kind of doldrum days of a startup owner, especially when you're raising capital and trying to do great things and trying to convince people that it's a great thing. Um, you, passion def passion is definitely needed. So. Um, let's see, we have about three or four more questions, I think. So we'll get through these and I think we'll, we'll, we'll be at the end of the list here. Um, where will you be sourcing the DNA data? Will there be a kit or something that I can send my DNA out in? So no, we, we don't do testing. We're not in that business. Um, there are enough companies out there competing in the testing market. There's hundreds actually where you can buy da uh, DNA tests and, and get your data. Um, we chose to uh, focus only on the marketplace for the data after people get tested. Um, we have a couple of partners we list on our page who do testing, who also agree with our philosophy. Um, but um, I mean, you can choose those or um, you, you can just choose one of the big commercial uh, companies and, and opt out of having that data used in science. Okay, so yes, but maybe asks from YouTube, what happens two years down the line if I buy the bond? Are there still interests? I guess, uh, is interest still paid, I guess? My English is kind of hindering me from fully grasping this in the bond information. Yep, there's a 7% um, interest payment on every bond um, held uh, every year. So it's after 365 days, you'll get the 7% and then the second, it's another 7% and then you can choose to convert it or uh, cash it out. Yep. So I think that I, I'm not sure I'm understanding. Maybe the question might be after two years. So after the after the maturity date, after those two years expire, you have a choice to either get your initial investment back uh, or to convert those bonds into equity ownership of the company at a valuation that would be uh, that that will be stated at the time of conversion. Um, so the interest would stop, but it would you would have the ability to convert into equity if you like what you've seen the company do over the last two years. Um, okay, so uh, where do we find the CM flash sales? I'm on Telegram, but no news. Yeah, we're not announcing them yet, so that's the trick. you got to pay attention. Um, yeah. once, you're, uh, once you're in that um, Telegram that's linked from our website, encryption.com, um, there will be an announcement, but you got to you know, wait for it. I'm not going to tell you when the flash sale announcement is going to be. You're going to have to, you know, be on the ball. 
Yep. So pay attention to the to their Telegram. Once they announce it, we'll probably pick it up because we're paying attention and we'll announce it in our own Telegram channel as well. But just yeah, you have, you have the whole point of a flash sale, guys. The reason why the reason why flash sales are used is because it keeps a captive audience. Which means if you want to know when you can get this great deal, you got to pay attention. No, you know you you can't just sit around and and kind of lollygag. You actually have to be in the group. You have to participate. And then you're going to get the information. So you haven't seen it yet because it's not been released yet. But just keep paying attention. I'll say hi. I'll drop by and say hi. <laughs> yeah. uh, so who are the main competitors in crypto space to encryption? It's a good question. Good question. So um, there's a couple of companies that came along after we started uh, that we considered our main competitors until recently. Uh, one was um, Nebula Genomics. Uh, another was Luna DNA. Those are their um, first ones. Um, both of them went off in different directions. None of them remained crypto uh, companies. Um, another one that came along a couple of years ago was Shivom. Um, Shivom raised uh, $35 million, um, And uh, you're welcome to look and see how they're doing these days. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I met the Shivom guys in China back in 2018, I think. Um, yeah. I, I have one I'm thing a, about Shivom. Yeah, just ahead. one. The marketing was fantastic. Uh, they, I, they, they made a video that I swear to God looked like Steven Spielberg made it. It must have cost 300K for this yeah. advertising video they made. It was absolutely stunning. But yeah, that's where the money went because the Shavom is, is pretty much off the map. Yeah, yeah pretty much off the map, I would say. Um, and uh, the, another one is genomes.io. Um, and they're a, a UK company. Uh, they're actually kind of interesting. Uh, um, and we're, you know, we're keeping an eye on them, see what they do. Um, but um, oh, there's lots of room in, <laughs> in 7 billion um, human beings worth of genome data uh, for us all yeah. to compute. So this is an interesting question. And then I think uh, we might be done. We have one, one, one comment that I have to show at the end because it's going to mean that this was a fantastic, you, you answered your, the questions perfectly because this last, anyway, you'll have to see it to, to okay. understand so uh, grants, for example, for bid DNA tests, this is coming from Reback 2K and DNA set sales. Uh, what's your strategy on this on these European issues? So already touched on it a bit. I think it's mainly going to be through, at least initially, through kind of um, partnerships with uh, clinical trials and things like that, that you get into these different countries, like in Africa, like in the Af African uh, clinical trials. Right. But um, yeah. So French researchers, uh, if they're forbidden from accessing our, our database, which I don't think is the case, um, uh, we'll have to be on guard for that. Um, that's not the case under current law. Um, the DNA, the, the way I understand um, this question is that um, you're not, that there are limitations on, on the genetic testing itself. Uh, so people trying to get genetic testing in some European countries have trouble because of the restrictions. Um, and some of that is related to the GDPR and some of it isn't. Uh, and some of it's just local um, laws and concerns. Um, but, you know, for our marketplace, one of our caveats is that you have to be legally capable of buying and selling the data you're buying and selling there, uh, which is the way a lot of uh, marketplaces deal with um, cross-border issues. Absolutely. It's, it would be impossible for a marketplace to try and, and actually not even necessary for the marketplace itself. Since it's a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, the seller has to be aware of what uh, restrictions they have on them as does the buyer. So, right. um, Okay. So I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave with this comment because it shows that you knocked it out of the park. Um, and here we go from our friend, Chuck. He was on the fence about buying bonds, David, but he's getting some now. You're the man, uh, Chuck. Thank, thank. So you, you, you answered Chuck's questions, which means that you did a very good job. So I think we're going to leave it there. We went over about 23 minutes, but for good reason. I think we got through pretty much every question. Somebody did ask how to buy bonds, but somebody else in the chat was quick enough to answer the question for us. Um, so for those of you who don't know, you can go right on CoinMetro's website, click on invest once you're on the Go platform. So go.coinmetro.com. Look up on the top, you'll see invest. Click there. EncryptGen will come up right at the top of the screen. And you can go ahead and go through the process to buy bonds. Um, so, David, if you have anything else to add, I'll let you, and then I'll, I'm just going to do a quick goodbye. No, I'm just really grateful that uh, uh, we're working with you guys, um, Kevin. It's been a pleasure as as always, um, and you know, I'm a I'm a huge fan of what you've done. 
Thank you. I'm, I, and I'm a big fan of what you've done. At some point, I will get a DNA test and I'm going to become a, a member of the marketplace. I haven't done it yet. I'm, I, those things always kind of freak me out, to be honest, uh, to, to a certain extent. I don't know. I'm not it's a less, privacy. It's less painful than a COVID test. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I've gotten 15 of those already. So yeah. I think my DNA absolutely is somewhere already because I'm sure they're I have this vision that they're scraping DNA every time, uh, and now they're just going to have a massive DNA database of everybody that has to get a COVID test. It's like two, it's like killing two birds with one stone. Um, so, so anyway, I, I appreciate it, David. Definitely, I, I, the the encryption, awesome business, awesome project. I think there's there's sky's the limit for you guys. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you for taking the time to answer everybody's questions. Thank everybody for uh, coming in and asking those questions. Some of them were very good. Thank you, Chuck for coming in and asking your questions as well and everybody else. Um, that's it. So hopefully uh, you guys got the information you need. If you haven't, make sure you go on Twitter, EncryptGen. Make sure you find David uh, on that Twitter. You can, you, can, you can find David's Twitter as well. I'm sure he's floating around there, as well as on the unofficial Telegram. Uh, you can also ask questions in CoinMetro's Telegram. We'll make sure that they get to the right person. And uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks for paying attention. And keep paying attention for that flash sale information. Make sure, again, you get on that Twitter that's below inside of the banner as you see scrolling across the screen. So have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks, David. All right. Cheers. Take care.